Welcome back to Securing Digital Democracy. Today is the final lecture, and um, I would be remiss if I, I didn't include in the course a, a discussion of e-voting and public policy. Uh, the question is, how, how do the rules that govern the elections that we conduct get made? Um, there are laws, there are government regulations, there are standards. Um, but based on all of the problems we've seen, um, these clearly add up to something that's inadequate. And when you understand a bit more about the process and the rules that are on the book, um, you, you'll understand a little bit better why we're in such a mess. Um, our focus is going to be on election policy in the U.S. because e every country is different and has a different story. Um, I'm going to give you um, a basic overview of um, the, uh, the, the way election policy gets made in the U.S., but uh, if you want more details, um, I'll refer you to uh, our recommended textbook, Broken Ballots, which has a, a, a much more thorough coverage. Election policy in the U.S. begins at the federal level, although the federal government turns out to have a very hands-off role. It sets minimum standards for elections across the country and provides advisory guidelines to the states. Its primary function and its, its strongest role is ensuring that civil rights of all citizens are upheld. Most of election policy in the U.S. gets set at the state level. States set the requirements for elections within their borders. They perform certification of election equipment and they're the central focus of election administration. In each state, uh, usually the Secretary of State's office is responsible for conducting elections and has uh, the final say about how elections are conducted within the state. Finally, most of the actual work of running elections happens at the local level, in individual um, counties or cities usually. In most states, local municipalities are responsible for purchasing decisions. They can select from any kind of equipment that's been approved by their state. They're also in charge for implementing the election rules and procedures and for actually running the election. At that point, a lot of the work ends up getting done by volunteers who take part in administering the system on election day. Since it's really the states that have the most to do with um, setting the rules under which voting systems are used, um, I, I want to start by talking about um, how, um, how state laws influence the process and, and some of the problems that they cause for security. One problem is that each state regulates voting independently. And so there's a tremendous lack of uniformity or consistency from state to state. This causes numerous problems, uh, including that when there are calls for reform, those battles have to be fought again and again across the country. It also greatly complicates the construction of, um, of voting machinery, since if a company wants to sell a voting machine um, across the country, it has to build in features that accommodate the different laws of each state. Um, this is part of the reason that uh, the DRE voting system software we examined in the top to bottom review, for instance, is, is so tremendously complex. Another problem with state law is that um, uh, makers of voting machines, vendors, um, have for many years tried to influence state law um, in order to uh, make sure that their, their voting machines have, um, uh, have, have a sound market. And this has led to a phenomenon called regulatory capture. The idea behind regulatory capture is that the, the companies that want to sell things to the state have a reason to want to try to influence what the law says. And they want to influence in two ways. First, to make it easier to sell their equipment, so whatever machines they make, uh, they want to make sure that the, the law will accept what they, they already have to sell. Um, but secondly, they want to influence the law so that other competitors' new entrants to the market, for instance, will have a harder time selling their equipment. Now, because of this incentive and this phenomenon of regulatory capture, um, election law in, in many states is, is heavily influenced by the, uh, by the properties and desires of very specific voting technologies. Um, and this, this has been a problem all the way back to the days of lever machines. You can still see the effects of this 
in laws in many states that have terribly antiquated rules um, that just have been very, very slow to adopt to the introduction of new technology, even to the, the introduction of computer voting in, in any form, which has been available now for more than two decades. One example of this is um, the state of New Jersey, um, where they have um, um, uh, a three-person panel of election um, uh, election examiners who are responsible for evaluating new voting machinery before it's sold in the state. And you might think that um, a, a modern panel of election advisors would, uh, or examiners would, would want to know something about computer security. Um, but in fact, the law in New Jersey says that the uh, election examiners have to include one person with experience in patent law and two people with experience in mechanics. This is exactly what was suited for evaluating lever machines back when they were first introduced early in the 20th century, when there were uh, numerous patents governing their use, and um, well, you, you really wanted people who knew something about gears and, and levers um, in order to evaluate how well um, they, they might function. But in a, a modern time, we need people who have expertise in many other different things in order to make sound purchasing decisions. We'd want people who know about security, who know about usability, etc. Um, unfortunately, laws are usually very slow to adapt to new technology, and state election law is certainly a case where that's true in many parts of the country. Federal regulation of election technology really gained ground around 1990 with the introduction of the first federal standards, which were issued by the Federal Election Commission, or FEC. And the idea here was to try to create some kind of uniform minimum standards that states could adopt. Many states since then have incorporated the FEC standards into their state law. And um, by uh, the time the standards were obsolete, a majority of states had done that. Um, the federal government doesn't, by itself, um, have much authority to impose rules like these on states. Um, and so the rules were, um, uh, were issued by the government as a kind of voluntary standard. It was up to each state to decide whether to adopt and incorporate them. The problem with the 1990 standards um, was that they just weren't very good at uh, addressing the, uh, the security needs of elections. Um, if you read through the standards document, um, most of it is dedicated to um, physical testing standards, what are known as shake and bake tests. That is, we want to make sure that the voting machines are going to survive storage in high temperatures or uh, physical vibrations in transport, drop tests, etc. Those are the kinds of things that these standards were really good at testing for. And not that they're not important. We do need our machines to function reliably under all sorts of conditions. But unfortunately, the other parts of the standard that tried to address software behavior and security were extremely weak. The software standards were, were mostly, um, uh, mostly addressing the, the, the form of the software rather than the behavior, um, uh, ensuring things like that um, uh, the software shouldn't have any go-to statements for, for you programmers out there. Or if they did use any go-to statements, um, the manufacturer would have to justify them with comments in the code. Now, this is nowhere near the kind of um, advice you need to make software that's secure versus insecure. And the security standards in the 1990 um, uh, voluntary guidelines were incredibly weak. The most significant reform ever to take place in the federal election policy in the U.S. came in the wake of the 2000 presidential election and was specifically caused by the recount debacle in Florida over problems like these butterfly punch card ballots that we talked about in earlier lectures. After the embarrassment and debacle in Florida, Congress responded two years later by passing the Help America Vote Act of 2002, which is widely known as HAVA. HAVA was a major piece of reform. It mandated that states would replace their punched cards and lever machines and provided more than $2 billion in federal money to get them to do it. Although it was passed in 2002, the deadline for implementing these reforms was fairly quick, 2006. So states had only about four years to upgrade their voting equipment.
Hava also included several other important reforms. It created a new agency, the Election Assistance Commission, or EAC, to be in charge of setting um, guidelines and standards for voting. The EAC was charged with maintaining something called the Voluntary Voting Systems Guidelines, or VVSG, that would replace the earlier FEC requirements. The first VVSG standards took effect in 2007. But notice that this is after the deadline for buying new equipment. So there was no way that any new and wiser guidelines that this agency would produce would have an effect on the equipment that was already going to be purchased with the federal money. There just wasn't enough time. As a result of this, states rushed out and bought the new equipment that was then on the market. And what many states did was they bought DRE voting machines, the, the shiny new technology. Um, the wide growth of the use of DREs in uh, the U.S. over the last decade is largely the fault of, of this problem with HAVA, that it provided states with money but very little time, and it didn't provide regulators with enough time um, to, uh, to devise adequate rules for the new technology. Um, but if you think about it from a manufacturer's perspective, um, uh, a voting system vendor, um, states were going to have all this money to upgrade their systems, and then they weren't going to have money again from the federal government, possibly for a long time. So if you were a maker of voting equipment, you had to get whatever you could on the market as soon as possible in order to take advantage of this federal subsidy. Uh, I think this is a large part of why the DREs that um, were in widespread use um, um, have, have such bad security. There just wasn't time. Um, for vendors to write secure software and get it out on the market if they waited until um, they had uh, had done more testing or spent more resources on security um, others would have beaten to them to the market and uh, this chance at HAVA money would likely be lost. HAVA led to the creation of a new set of standards for the states in the form of the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines or VVSG these were developed using an improved process. They were written by something called the Technical Guidelines Development Committee, which was managed by NIST, one of the most scientifically focused federal agencies. The first VVSG um, standards came out in 2005. And because it would take voting system vendors a while to, to actually implement them, they didn't go into effect until two years later. The 2005 guidelines were a lot more detailed than uh, the earlier FEC guidelines from 1990. They in included um, uh, far more information about how vendors should address the same sorts of problems that appeared in the 1990 document. They still had a number of large loopholes. For one, vendors could make use of commercial off-the-shelf software for certain parts of their systems and, and largely avoid scrutiny. Second, there was no requirement of a voter verifiable paper audit trail or any auditable paper ballots. In 2007, the Technical Guidelines Committee drafted a new set of requirements. These were essentially a complete rewrite of the earlier standards. There were some major new security features. For one, software independence was required so that if a computer voting system had any kind of undetectable change or error in its software, that couldn't result in an undetected change or error in the election results. Furthermore, the requirements for security testing were completely revamped, and the older testing process that had resulted in uh, vastly insecure machines ending up on the market was augmented by a, a new kind of testing process that looked a lot like some of the uh, state and academic studies that had found problems in earlier voting systems. Unfortunately, the 2007 draft guidelines were never adopted by the EAC, so they, they never went into force. And this is likely um, because of resistance to the notion of software independence, which would effectively make it impossible to sell paperless DREs. Since the 2007 guidelines were never officially adopted, um, the federal guidelines that came out of HAVA um, unfortunately still leave a lot to be desired when it comes to security.
There have been some attempts to improve the state of things, however. Um, probably the most significant are due to this man, Congressman Rush Holt from New Jersey. Congressman Holt consulted with computer scientists and, and voting experts to draft a series of bills that would reform the federal process. Holt's legislation would require a voter-verified paper record, or in later versions, a voter-marked paper ballot, prohibiting the use of paperless DREs. It would also prohibit the use of undisclosed software. So every piece of software in the voting system had to be known about and had to be available to security review. Furthermore, it would prohibit internet connections as part of the voting system, and it would introduce uniform requirements for mandatory random audits. Although Holt's bills had pretty broad bipartisan support, they unfortunately never managed to pass the House. And so to this day, this kind of reform is lacking. Although federal reform is effectively stalled for now, um, there have been some very successful efforts to um, improve the state of election security requirements uh, on a state-by-state -state basis. And due to the efforts of reformers and advocates, 31 states now require some form of voter verifiable paper record to be used in the election process. Unfortunately, there's still 29 states that don't, and for now, it looks like it's going to be a state-by-state -state battle to get requirements like that in place. But since the introduction of an auditable paper record is the, the most significant kind of uh, improvement we could make to the security of electronic voting systems, um, I hope efforts like this are going to continue, even if they might be a hard fight.